very warm welcome to all the participants across the globe from India. Good evening, India time. I am Pooja Anand. I'm a practicing lawyer since the last 26 years in the Honorable Supreme Court and the High Court and a mediator, negotiator, conciliator since the last 12 years in the Honorable Supreme Court and the Honorable Delhi High Court Mediation and Conciliation Center, Samadhan. My co-host, Ms. Sujita Srivastav, has been a practicing lawyer in the Honorable Supreme Court since the last 23 years. And she has recently joined since the last two, three years, the bandwagon of mediation movement. We together will take the evening forward. The roadmap is that after the introduction of the topic and our guest speaker, Honorable Mr. Justice Francis H. V. Bell, there will be a lecture from him an open house where between myself and Sujita, we'll take up as many questions as possible from the audiences. And we request the audience to kindly put up all your queries and questions into the chat box. And we will try and take up as many questions as possible for the evening. Thereafter, my friend Sujita will propose a word of thanks. That being said, I welcome all of you all once again to today's evening lecture, which is the sixth in series. The lecture series were conceptualized by four senior advocates of the Supreme Court of India as an ongoing learning process to find about the nuances of mediation. The first lecture series was held in January 2020, where we were fortunate to meet as it was pre-COVID time, but COVID did not deter the spirit of learning. And therefore, the lecture series continued on the online platform. The Supreme Court mediators of India have coined a name for themselves. And it is my proud privilege to tell the name to the world, Nivaran. Nivaran in its translation stands for salvation from saving someone from harm. And that is exactly what the mediator's role is. That is exactly what they attempt to do. They might not be a settlement of a mediation, but the process is never a failure because it opens the road for future communications, future negotiations. With that note, I welcome you all to the sixth session of Nevaran and the lecture series is, today has chosen a very relevant topic, which is community mediation. We have been very fortunate that Honorable Mr. Justice Francis H. V. Bell acknowledged the need for speaking on this topic. He has been a torch bearer for this topic, and he gave his consent to speak. I also here would like to mention that the Supreme Court mediators of India have also been conducting simultaneously another lecture series in association with Commonwealth Lawyers Association. There have been three lecture series so far in that series, and we were so fortunate to have an esteemed panelist over there from Honorable Mr. Justice Arjun K. Sikri to Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishan Call, Honorable Ms. Justice Indira Banerjee, and also Honorable Justice Vishesh Kokhari, Judge Trinidad and Tobago. The topic for today It is said often that litigation is like an unwelcome house guest which chooses to stay on for years and at times at even decades. Now the time is where people are yearning for quick and efficient relief without wasting much money and time. And therefore, the community mediation is what is sought for. I present here Justice Francis Bell. He is presently Justice of Appeal of the Supreme Court of Judicature of Barbados and a half-time judge of the United Nations Dispute Tribunal. At present, Justice Francis Bell advises the court-connected mediation office in Barbados and works closely with the Weinstein International Foundation, of which he is holding senior fellowship. 
The Weinstein Foundation is an international organization of mediators, which trains mediators and organizes mediation workshops all over the world. The foundation also supports programs for the development of mediation and conflict resolution systems in various countries. Justice Bell has done most of his mediation work in the Eastern Caribbean, commencing in the British Virgin Islands in 2002. Following this experience on his elevation to the bench in, in 2003, Justice Bell chaired court-connected mediation committees in Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, and St. Lucia before returning to Barbados, where he assumed the position of Justice of Appeal in January of 2020. More recently, Justice Bell has assisted St. Lucian institutions such as the Cooperative Choice Group and the Resolvers with their work in planning and implementation in education programs in media and conflict resolution. Justice Bell has also advised on draft Community Mediation Act in St. Lucia and a draft practice direction for online mediation in Barbados. Before I pass on the virtual dice to Honorable Justice Francis Bell, I would again request all the participants to kindly post your relevant questions for today's topic in the chat box. And between Sujita and me, we will try and take up as many as possible because of the paucity of time, we may not be able to answer all the questions, but we will definitely try and request Honorable Justice Francis Bell to answer the same. Over to you, Justice Francis Bell, to take the evening forward. And I welcome once again, everyone on behalf of Nivaran. Uh, Justice Bell, please. So you are mute, sir. You have to unmute yourself, please. Yes. Good Thank evening you. to you uh, and good morning to those who are in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I am going to have to do my best to say what I want to say in the time allotted. Um, it is usually <laughs> a situation um, that I have difficulty sometimes because I have so much to say about mediation. Um, I have difficulty sometimes um, actually restraining myself to the time, but I've set myself a little clock here that is gonna tell me when my time is up. So what I wanna say a few things about um, my introduction to the Indian continent in the past, just a couple of minutes. Um, Someone wanted me to read um, E.M. Foster's book, Passage to India, some years ago at school. I remember reading that book. And um, I, I don't know how much of it was accurate, but it, it was required reading for, I think, my advanced level courses at the time. So that was one. I was also very good at geography. So at one time I knew every river, every mountain range, et cetera, et cetera, all of the names of all the states, et cetera, in India. I, I don't anymore because I, I'm no longer studying geography. And um, it just so happened that in um, 2008, I went to the Commonwealth Judicial Education Institute course, trained the trainers course, and um, I was able to, well, I, I, I had to meet persons from all over the Commonwealth. And of course, there were representatives from India. And um, I was speaking yesterday with some of your colleagues and I was trying to remember the name of the judge who I met at that time. His name is Mr. Justice Maran Lokur. Uh, and um, he, Later on, um, <clears throat> also became the editor, I think, of the Commonwealth Just Judicial Education Institute's um, magazine. Um, so I, I, I hope he's still active. Uh, could probably send greetings to him on my behalf. He hopefully will remember, will remember me. Um, so we're here to talk about 
community mediation. Um, and uh, I'm very happy that this is being sponsored by senior lawyers. Um, the, one of the battles that we have to fight in the Eastern Caribbean, and I think in other parts of the world, is that a lot of senior lawyers have not quite bought into some of these ideas. Um, in the Eastern Caribbean, mediation was introduced to the court system through the civil procedure rules of 2000, which rely heavily on, the, on similar rules in the United Kingdom of 1998. And um, there are in those rules, clear directions to the court to utilize alternative dispute resolution as much as possible, in particular mediation. And so that we, we embarked upon that program and we have actually a practice direction, which I have here with me, which I, I might get an opportunity to say something about. But because of the fact that these rules are, you know, in a, in a profession where people basically practice law for life, and um, I do not know how many uh, 90 year olds, they are practicing law in India. But I remember not too long ago, reading an article about a 90 something year old judge in the United States of America, and he was still active. He was still sitting, sitting judge at the age of 96 or something like that. Uh, so we don't stop working. And um, this is one of the things about it because it means that there are generations of practitioners represented at the bar. And some of those generations do not necessarily embrace new thinking. However, I've been told that mediation, the spirit of mediation is in India and has been there long, betime, long before I, I probably the, the, the ever, ever heard the word mediation. <laughs> so that is good. And that is one of the things I think that probably has assisted in bringing uh, senior practitioners on board. It is very good also that um, senior practitioners, and I think this is also unique, that senior practitioners um, would want to discuss the question of community mediation. In other words, you're not just stuck with the idea that mediation begins and ends with an attempt to control the numbers, so to speak. In other words, get rid of the backlog in the court system. Um, so you have this situation where the, 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 the lawyers are actually seeing the need to talk about a broader perspective, what mediation is about. It's not just about helping the court to get rid of its backlog. Um, of course, you who are actually trained mediators and who mediate know that there is much more to it and that in a mediation, uh, persons can save friendships, they can uh, save businesses, they can save relationships in general. Of course, they can save money, they can save time. And all, all of these are elements of the contribution of mediation, uh, not just to the court system, but to the community, because that individual who participates in a mediation process uh, goes back out into the community and will tell that story to other people, uh, to other business people or, or persons in the community. Um, if it was a, a, something to do with a, a contract relationship or, you know, they'll be able to relate to how this helped them, the business to continue in spite of a problem that they might have had and so on. So these are positive things for the community, for the ability of people to work together. Um, some time ago, I had an opportunity to go to uh, Suriname, since South America, not too far away from, well, next door to Guyana. And um, Suriname, they asked me to talk to them about dialogue, because they were having serious problems between political parties there. And Suriname, unfortunately, the, some of the political parties, they are based on race, some are based on religion and various ethnic issues, tribal issues, et cetera, et cetera. And that is part of the problem that they had. 
the, the, the theme under which the whole thing was organized was social cohesion. And uh, this is where mediation, I think, enters into the community, uh, the environment. You are trying your best to help. There are some of those natural things that help social cohesion is, you know, socialization there, you, you grow up in a community in a village or whatever, and you know, those people, you know, their habits, you, 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 you work things out together. So there's a natural idea of social cohesion, but there's also, and later on, I'll deal with this, the possibility of fracturing that. So why would you want to be a mediator in all of this? Um, when you look at your own society, what do you see? Are you, are you living in a society that is, you consider it to be peaceful? Are there lots of problems? I, I certainly don't want to tell you uh, what they might be, but I think you are aware of them. And um, a lot of them have to do with the differences that people have on basic issues. And maybe that is why today you are a mediator. From my own, uh, point of view, I actually was a prosecutor at one time. And um, I found that I could never go to in a criminal matter, whether I was uh, when I was on the defense bar at first, and, uh, and uh, feel very comfortable when the time came for somebody to be sentenced for an offense, uh, thinking that there was anything funny, or, you know, good about it in, 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 in a human sense, in a real human sense, other than, of course, they might have done harm to somebody and, you know, there was some kind of need for compensation or uh, retribution. But uh, by and large, it was not, it's not a happy time. And uh, becoming a prosecutor in the island of St. Kitts, I encountered a lot of petty crime where people clearly were not using their head. Small matters. Somebody says something to you, and they turn around and they and they stab them. Uh, there was a kind of a latent anger uh, in the in, in the in the in the personalities of a, of a lot of young people, and the question was why. But but um, I couldn't quite work out why. What I worked out was that maybe what I could do is to try to learn some skills so that when I had an opportunity to speak to these people. I would tell them, but well, you know, somebody says something to you, you do not have to retaliate with anything physical. You could say something back or you could just ignore it and walk away. Um, the old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt. Not quite true, words do hurt, but at the end of the day, you know, they hurt in a totally different way. They don't maim or disfigure. They don't prevent you from being able to go to work the next day and, and feed your family, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, uh, it still makes sense that you don't retaliate that way. And that is where I really started to develop a serious interest. Many years before that, or about a few years before that, I was working for a trade union and that was my first exposure to mediation. And of course, mediation continued to exist in the trade union movement. Constellation, they tend to call it. Um, but it basically boils down to the same thing with the labor department trying to help unions and employers to come to some accommodation on various issues. So I leave that with you. Uh, why do you want to be a mediator? How do you see your community? How do you see yourself fitting in at this particular point in time? Um, now I'm trying to get this screen to become large. I have seen to have forgotten how to do it. Um, but I hope that you are seeing the screen, my presentation. Basically, I am going to be talking to you about uh, my journey and uh, how that journey has contributed to my being able to, to um, work in community mediation over a period of time. So I was able to start out with mediation in a formal sense 
after that experience that I spoke about. And that experience that I spoke about began, as I said, as a, as a prosecutor. So from there, I went to trying to learn more about mediation. I had to get training and I entered a, a school which I saw online, uh, Nova Southeastern University, and I, I got myself training in a much broader topic of conflict resolution and obtained a, a master's degree in conflict resolution. But of course, mediation was a very important component of that. Um, having done that on my return to the Virgin Islands where I was at the time, I was able to then be uh, play a pivotal role in the actual rollout of the mediation process there in the court system. So I was, the timing was great because when I got back, when I, when I completed my course, that was exactly when the mediation uh, program was being rolled out in about 2002, between 2002 and 2003. Uh, we were selecting mediators, we were training them, uh, and so on. I actually uh, was able to organize a training privately. I do not know if you have ever heard of the group of, from Canada called Stickfeld Handy. Um, not an advertisement, but just to say that they, they were the ones who trained me first. And then they trained about 12 other persons at the time uh, in Virgin Islands, both Virgin Islands, both the US and British, they came from and um, they did that training. So that was my first uh, apart from the academic training, that was my first practical training with an with actual dedicated trainer. Thereafter, I was trained with a court. Um, and so that, that accounts for my training. Now, I had to look back, of course, as I'm saying here, over a period of about 35 years of my trying to understand how the legal system works and um, where it does a good job and where it doesn't necessarily do a very good job. So I just want to move on to where is the, this kind of a, um, jurisprudential basis for mediation. Uh, it has nothing to do with um, cutting down the backlog. That's not jurisprudence. That's um, prudence, but not jurisprudence. That's that's. Uh, people thinking of what looks good and of course what is efficient for the, for the community to be able to have cases dealt with swiftly. But in reading around on this topic, I was able to find that there were actually debates going on in the jurisprudence world as to whether or not the law, the law courts, were always preeminently suitable for the settlement of disputes. To put it very, very, um, you know, in normal language, the language that we have here is our law and adjudication preeminently desirable means of subjecting human conduct to the governance of rules and resolving disputes about those rules from among the class of non-arbitrary ways of so subjecting human conduct and resolving disputes attributed to William Lucy in the, in the um, text, Jurisprudence and Philosophy of Law. And uh, basically, this discussion, uh, out of this discussion, you see then the, the jurisprudential basis for mediation. Because by and large, law, they are lawyers themselves. They are jurists themselves who have come to the conclusion that not in all cases is law the right way, the ordinary, the rules of evidence, et cetera, the, the civil procedure rules and so on. Not in every case are these <laughs> the right formula for resolving issues between persons. Uh, there's one judge who, who had early in the stages of uh, rolling out mediation um, had said to me that um, he, was aware of a situation in the 
uh, uh, where he worked in Antigua, where um, the, 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 there was a, a, a gentleman who came to court for, an, for a matter. And when he was called upon to speak, he said, well, you know, judge, I, I, I don't have anything to say. And then the, 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 the evidence came and uh, the person on the other side said to him that they were sorry. And this elderly gentleman just turned and walked out of the court. He didn't have any more interest in the court matter other than the fact that they, he wanted to hear the person on the other side say, I'm sorry. And having heard that, he was finished with it. Didn't want to hear anything else. Now, ordinarily, it would take a while to get there. And in a lot of cases, because of pride, et cetera, et cetera, we wouldn't get there at all. Uh, nobody would be saying they're sorry. Although I do think that there is some effort on the part of the, the system to you know, bring about that kind of interaction in terms of what we call case management. But by and large, um, a lot of times we don't get there. We don't get around to actually talking that way to each other. Mediation gives us the opportunity to do so. Some of you may have been exposed to the text, get into yes, and other texts about uh, mediation and um, the fact that you don't mediate personalities, you don't mediate about the people, you, 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 you mediate about the problem. And um, that is based on the theory behind Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And um, so that people enter into disputes because they have needs and they may feel that those needs are not being um, served. I'll just, just a second, I need to. Yeah, they may feel that those needs are not being served or is, uh, uh, something somewhere along the line, there's a deficiency as a result of uh, something isn't fair, something isn't right. They're not being properly compensated after an accident or something. And, um, you know, you see it a lot in, um, in, in labor law cases, in employment law cases, where the feelings of, of people in relation to what is happening to them is not just about the money. It is also about things like status and, 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 and what, how this is going to feel, et cetera, if they lose their job, et cetera. Um, so if you, Remember that in your mediation, then when there are two sides, or maybe there are more than one, there are two sides, and sometimes in community mediation, there may be more than two. Um, everybody has basic needs. And most of the time in a mediation, the, the quarrel, to put it in common language, is about the basic needs. It's really not about some of the things that you would see expressed in court, uh, he failed to sign the document, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's about the need behind that. And, um, and I just thought I would list some of those because it, it, it takes up too much space to try to list all of them. But there's, there's obviously the need for ordinary nourishment and protection, et cetera, um, safety, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why the, the whole debate in the United States about defund the police is interesting because uh, obviously the, the reaction of, of the other side will be, well, you, you don't want our streets to be safe. And of course, that's not what they're saying. They're saying you put so much money into the police and you neglect basic things that cause the problems that the police tend to have to attend to, but they have to attend to them as police and not as social workers, et cetera, et cetera. So basic needs, be assured of continued safety, um, valued for your, by your peers, valued in your workplace, et cetera, et cetera. These are basic needs. And these come up, I would think that um, they come up in uh, mediation all the time. They may not be articulated up front, but they are on the line. In the, in, 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 in the process and in, the, in, the, in what is being expressed. 
So you take a look at that. And um, you want to know that you're a contributing member of society. So every now and then somebody should give you a little praise. Um, this is happening in, in right now. This is happening with the frontline workers all over the world as a result of the COVID. Um, you know, people are actually saying for the first time in a long time, we love nurses, we love doctors. You know, there actually was a period of time when people didn't used to say they love doctors. Uh, they felt they charged too much money, et cetera, et cetera. Now we, everybody's saying, well, we love the doctors. They, they're doing a great job. Um, but because the need is so strong, so great at this particular point in time that they have to respond that way. So remember the hierarchy of needs and remember that um, the, these needs are, as they are expressed in court and underlying, they are also expressed out there in the community. As I put it in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in um, some of the introductory stuff that I've given to your colleagues, um, <clears throat> you're getting it in the community, you're getting it raw. You're not getting it nicely, nicely written by the, the lawyer after taking instructions, you're getting it raw. And that is where the needs then have to be understood. Um, conflict, of course, is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And it's also necessary, of course, to put certain things right. Um, if we are to pursue on the road to happiness, we have to manage that conflict, however, because, of course, it can get out of hand, as we have seen. Um, I don't know. How do you answer that question? Is that all, all, all we need is love? That's what the Beatles said. Um, <clears throat> now, every community has their, their myths and old stories and folklore and so on and so forth. You know, in Barbados, we have all sorts of talk about uh, <clears throat> people with spiritual powers, et cetera, et cetera. We have things that, that oh, there was a story recently on television where this gentleman said he used to be told not to go down into the gully near the cemetery, because when you look down there in the night, you see these little lights, you know, moving around. And he said, and those are the spirits. That's what he was told by his grandmother. And of course, uh, he later found out that those were fireflies, um, which we have, a plenty in this part of the world. So you see how something which is quite natural can be spoken about and made to appear totally uh, unnatural. But it doesn't mean that you dismiss everything that's supernatural. It's just that the question of the context in which it is used um, and the extent to which it may be used to control rather than to educate or enlighten, that is the important issue. So remember that we are socialized and um, this is part of what you're dealing with in the, in the um, management world. <clears throat> um, they, they, they call it mental models, where people come to work with a particular mental model. And uh, that then has to be reconstructed in order for progress to be made in the workplace, um, in management studies. So in, from my perspective, in a, and, and you would have had, had some experience with this as well in India and other parts of the world, uh, the, the um, basis of unity <clears throat> is often this ability to convince people that you, know, you, you, you have to do things humbly and accept uh, the controlling powers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera with independence of thought and, and, and political independence, I would say cultural independence, we, 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 we kind of break down some of those things and then we have to rebuild, of course. Um, and then of course, there's always the influence of the outside world um, so that the, all of our societies are changing because with technology, et cetera, we now have that influence as part of the situation that we have to deal with where life is no longer as simple as it used to be. 
But rather than telling people, well, you have to do this, and you know, you will, people always said you have to do this and you have to do that. We, what I'm proposing is that we need dialogue. We need to be able to develop the skills of dialogue. Um, and uh, first of all, we have to ex um, understand the importance of freedom of speech and also understand the importance of keeping people informed. The media, very important. Um, persons with technical skills, scientists, et cetera, in the, in, in the present situation, very important. Not coercion, but of course, persuasion. At the same time, not persuasion by some of the old techniques that in the, in the book called Straight and Crook Crooked Thinking, where you just repeat things that are untrue or repeat, repeat things because you feel that if you repeat them enough, somebody will believe it. But actually persuading with proper research, proper information, uh, et cetera. And, and, and this is part, I think, of mediation, although the mediator, his or herself, may not be the person doing the, well, should not be the person doing the persuasion. What you will be doing is facilitating the ability of the parties to inform themselves so that they can be persuaded one way or the other. Um, be able to be critical of your own ideas and to listen, you all, you all know about listening, active listening uh, uh, qualities in terms of uh, mediation skills. You have to be able to, to listen actively uh, so that you're not just hearing words, but you're hearing feelings. And as I said, the underlying needs are coming out. <clears throat> when I... Um, got into contact with, when I became connected with Weinstein and it was initially with JAMS, which is Judicial Arbitration and, and Mediation Services in the United States, so a law firm which does only mediation. I had made a proposal then because I came to the conclusion that I think thought I could contribute more to mediation, not just in the court system, but throughout the region in the communities. And I made that proposal and um, it was largely because of <clears throat> things that I had encountered in the judiciary as a judge. Um, and uh, as a high court judge, of course, you come across some of the common problems in, 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 in St. Lucia, where I was at the time as a high court judge, it was land disputes. And uh, land disputes that were arising in situations where families, traditionally stayed on land without anybody arguing about how much land was theirs and how much land was somebody else's. They all communally owned and enjoyed the fruits of the land. But as time de developed and people learned that land was very valuable and started going to the bank and the bank would tell them, well, you need to have your own little plot marked out and we have to know how much it measures and what is valued, et cetera, et cetera, the disputes started to arise. And so that we see how modernization then contributes to that conflict. That was the area that I latched on to and said, we need mediators in the community. Otherwise, we're going to be overwhelmed with these cases in the court. So it was some self-interest in it. But at the same time, I think it's also community interest because some of these matters are settled in, in the streets or in the fields in the sense of people physically getting involved in fight, you know, in, 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 in going to war, so to speak, over the, um, over the, the land disputes. <clears throat> so you have to look at these in context, in your own context, as to what may be of a similar nature um, and understand that and this is a good example of it, where in, in the old days, those families used to keep things together. Here it is, where there are tendencies towards unity, cohesion, brotherhood, commitment, solidarity, community, etc. Alterity or otherness is under production. And that is where the seeds of conflict are soon. So there's always going to be conflict. Um, I'm going to wrap up soon. Uh, I had an opportunity with my when I got my fellowship to actually see some of this community work in action. 
think it think in terms of thinking outside the box a mediation center became safe our streets uh the mediators became interveners uh who were trained who were trained to stop an epidemic of violence that was going on in that part of new york city at the time so what they would go and do is speak to the paper somebody suffered a injury or even sometimes a death and they would go and talk to the family and say please you know do not retaliate uh in the ordinary way there's a there's a legal system there's a way to deal with this do not go and get somebody to go and you know shoot somebody else or stab somebody else and that and that's what they did and that was that became the dedicated purpose of what used to be the crown heights brooklyn mediation center these are some of the persons who bad picture because it was taken with a with a um cell phone but these are some of the gentlemen who went out there and did that work in crown heights brooklyn but you also have the other approach where <clears throat> a much uh different looking kind of situation but they were also approaches in that developed world state not as easy to do in 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 the developing world in the caribbean but where there are the resources um the various interest groups can get together and set up private mediation services they get some of the work from the court they get some of the work from the community they devise their own training they um work on the <clears throat> on their own um programs and support various kinds of programs uh in the court system one of the programs supported by the new york peace institute for example was on a recent recidivism uh where they went into harlem and they and they and they helped to set up a program there uh there were certain persons who support them supported that program where uh, they were trying to stop uh reduce the amount of recidivism um of course part of the process of going out there and getting trained and 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 you know building relationships is that you build alliances and you and we had an opportunity in St. Lucia to have some mediators from New York come and speak to us uh that was at the time of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the court uh of course if the court in the eastern caribbean is is older than 50 years but at the time it is because it was reconstituted from a, a constitutional basis about just about a, a little bit more than 50 years ago so that's why we had a 50 year celebration but the important point is to understand that we we were able to build <clears throat> relationships with people outside and they then would help in the whole process of coming and and, and persuading people to use mediation and uh, helping people to understand how mediation is used in various different situations one of the myths out there for example is that you know mediation is 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 not going to be used in places where there's a lot of money involved and that kind of, that is not so i witnessed i shadowed mediation cases in new york where they were actually dealing with millions of dollars uh, in terms of interest uh, shareholders fighting uh, people fighting fighting over or uh, quarreling over um <clears throat> a damaged painting that was worth 2 million dollars etc so mediation can as you would know be in the uh, among things where you're you know you're 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 talking about things of not monumental value but then sometimes you can be dealing with some very very valuable uh things <clears throat> now i want to say that as time has developed i have been persuaded also that those of us who live in zones where there's a lot of potential for disaster bad weather claim as a result of climate change or otherwise i think mediators have a role to play in helping the societies to cope with some of the conflict that arises as a result there's a scarcity etc that results at that time and therefore you need to be able to respond to the conflicts that arise um you all would recognize where you might recognize what happened here this is a you're going to have political conflicts as well and these of course you have to know how to deal with them um 
com the photograph compliments of, I believe, the Washington Post. Um, you, you, you know what that was about. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But the real issue is what caused something like that to happen in a society. And um, this is where I've got to in terms of my reading and research, um, the whole idea of understanding narrative, um, stories being told. This, this theory, this work was developed in places like, uh, when studying places like Rwanda, uh, uh, the, 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 the Balkans in Europe and so on, the situation that was there, uh, Guatemala, Latin America, places in Latin America where conflict has got very, very, very violent. A lot of people have lost their lives. And the study of what happened is called the study of narrative. And that has opened my eyes to a lot of things and a better understanding of how in the community we have to be dealing with those narratives all the time. And what the mediator is going to be, have to be trained to do is to help people to tell a better story. Um, this is the, the, the book that is uh, circulating on that topic is called Speaking of, of Violence. So in, in a nutshell, um, <clears throat> thank you very much for listening. I want to be able to leave with you that what you want to be able to do is to tr get trained, of course, so that you can deal with, you can actually conduct mediation processes, mediation meetings, sessions, um, get trained also in broader conflict res resolution skills if possible, um, help to build the infrastructure for the practice of mediation in the community, help others to create institutions uh, as in St. Lucia, where we have now the, um, the mediation uh, forum. Uh, this, I, I think I, I have been helpful in building that institution. And um, also maybe help with the activities which will contribute to global institutions being formed. Uh, there is one in a global institution that deals, for example, with international um, climate change impact uh, it, it's situated in um, South Korea. I can't remember the name at the moment, but the, basically what they have on board there are, is, a, is, is a system of um, not adjudicating, but trying to, 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 first of all, manage these conflicts. And then mediation plays a part of it. So they have a, a, an entire um, system with various layers that goes through these problems and helps to resolve them. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I am very, very, um, I should have said at the beginning, very happy and uh, uh, to have been invited to make this presentation. Um, I'm honored uh, to, to be in this, uh, to be here uh, in this kind of setting and speaking to people I'm told from not just India, but all over the Commonwealth. I'm definitely honored to be in that position today. I'm very privileged. And uh, I thank you again. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was indeed enlightening to know that uh, community mediation mechanisms are viewed as an opportunity for citizens to participate in the prevention an early intervention of conflicts as an alternative to institutional mechanisms. In India, as you rightly had pointed out, uh, there has been a system of panchayats and also our Honorable Chief Justice of India had inaugurated the community uh, mediation clinics at grassroots levels in numerous villages. Uh, in, that was on 17th of January, 2009. Uh, sir, I'm just reading out questions from the audiences and uh, would request yeah. you to kindly answer. Uh, one of the esteemed uh, audience has mentioned this question. How is mediation process beneficial to the community in salvaging or assuaging the injury to the victim than getting accused punished through process of adjudication? All right, but that question seems to be focused mainly in the, in the criminal 
side. Um, it's not used as much in the, in, in the criminal arena as it is in the civil. But even in the civil side, you see sometimes what we have to recognize is that when, the, when a matter goes through adjudication, mm -hmm. there are certain things that can't be said uh, certain because of the hearsay rule, et cetera, et cetera. There's certain things that can't be, a lot of times when uh, crimes are committed, the only people who are there are the two people who are present or the three or whatever, the number of persons who are actually present when it, when it happens. And therefore, what has to be sorted out sometimes is the, the feelings in relation to these things. So I am not a, uh, necessarily in all in, in cases of criminal matters saying that one should choose mediation as, as the first option in, in, a, in a number of cases. In small cases, petty cases of maybe a, a, a slight assault, um, maybe some cases of, of petty theft, you might find that an individual is, is operating on the basis of a need, uh, something that happened off the spur of the moment without them thinking. And they need maybe conflict resolution skills, they need to be sent to anger management classes, they need to you know, develop those skills and their mediation can bring that out. So that is where I, I would, how I would answer that question that we are in the, in the, on the civil side, the same thing would, would be represented. If a person is feeling hurt by something that's taken away from them, um, it is always, it's not always the best solution to say um, the court then is gonna order that person to pay damages. And as a result, that relationship is forever fractured and you then damage this, the, the, the other side, the, the, the perpetrator to the point where they, they never can recover from it. So you have to look at a whole lot of things. Um, of course, in addition to that, the whole question of how long it's gonna take, how costly it's gonna, gonna be, um, in going through the court process. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. Susie, why don't you take over? You're mute, Sujita. Good evening, all, and thank you, John. Sir, there is a question. Uh, from uh, Mr. Rajiv Datta, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court. The question is that mediation is with consent. How can you have consent of community at large? Will the consent of leaders be enough? Right. Um, this is a, a, a good question because obviously in the community mediation setting, it is not like um, the court where you have a captive audience and a system in place where matters are referred to mediation. And you know, even if consent is reluctant, I think people want to comply with what they think the court wants. So they, 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 they consent to mediation. They can also be persuaded by their lawyers, et cetera. Um, in the community, as I, I, think, um, I think some work would have to be done. I think mediators have to do some talking to the community in general about mediation. I, I have done a lot of that in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, I think you have to understand the, the, the needs. You have to be able to have maybe the inputs of experts who can express to people the damage that can be done by continuing certain kinds of conflicts, allowing them to continue unabated. And therefore people have to respond to mediation from the point of view of, look, this, this, is, this is the best way I can resolve this dispute. And in that context, then they, um, I think what you would have to do is get some centers established so they can go to a center, go to, to, to a place where they can um, re, you know, report that they're having this problem and they would like it to be resolved. And that center then takes over the, uh, the aspect of it, which invites the other side to agree to proceed by way of mediation. And the me mechanics will, I guess, differ from place to place, um, but clearly court is a very convenient setting. Outside of the court, you're gonna have to build the institutions and the methods um, from brick to brick, so to speak, 
and getting that done, getting the, and, and getting to the point where people are happy to consent to have a mediation in, in, in these matters. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, Justice uh, Bell, this is question coming from one of our very senior mediators and master trainer, Ms. Uma Ramanathan. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for putting this question also. We learn how is cohesion brought about, especially when groups in the community project uh, different entitlements and emotions uh, they rule high and there is an anchor image and identity of such groups. Shall I repeat the question, sir? Um, well, I, I think I understood the first part of it better than the last part, but the, uh, yes, I'll they- I'll just repeat it. it again. How is cohesion brought about, especially when groups in the community project different entitlements and emotions rules high to anchor image and identity such groups? Uh, I'm okay. just reading it as it is. Yeah. yeah, right, right. So, yeah, I mean, um, that is very present. I think in all societies, you have you have um, what you have class and beyond it, and um, the it's a problem because every day when people see the the display, some people display it by ostentatious living and and so on and so forth by the things they say, their behavior. They don't want to have relations with a, another set of people. Um, you're going to have <laughs> that kind of issue. But you know, one of the things that we are learning as we go along, um, that climate change is teaching us, that COVID is teaching us, is that we are all in this thing together. This world is shared by all of us. So I think that's the kind of message that you have to get over to people. At the end of the day, the big house or whatever did not save you from COVID. Um, at the end of the day, it did not save you from a serious flood. And, you know, in, in, in the Western part of the United States, some of the most ostentatious living, they, they suffer um, wildfires every year in California. So you got to look at this thing from the point of view that, the, that actually nature is in charge and um, the best we can do is harness it. And we have to agree as a, as a human race how to do so. So the fact that we are in India or Africa or <coughs> Europe or wherever we are, and the fact that we may have more wealth or position, better position than somebody else, doesn't make us immune to these things. And therefore we have to learn how to, how to do what is necessary to, to, to protect the general society, general human race from these ills. I think that's the only way to get over to, to people, the, necess the necessity of cohesion and the, okay. and the importance of cohesion, social cohesion. Um, but it isn't easy. It isn't easy because um, as I said, the narratives <laughs> are there that um, so-and-so only wants to steal, steal what we have. Um, you know, they're ungrateful. They don't know how to behave and this and that. And um, that's why they are poor. That's, that's why they are needy. You know, that's why they have problems in their part of the society and not in ours. These are difficulties that you have to overcome, but you have to look at them from the point of view of the existential threats. And if, if people can understand the impact of the existential threats, then they may be able to comprehend that they have to be able to sit down at the table from time to time and work things out with people who uh, they have very you know, shallow relationships with, if, if any at all. Thank you, sir. Sujita. So Mr. Rajiv Dutta again um, has sent a second query, which is like, how do you ensure confidentiality in community mediation? It's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> That's a very good question. Um, it, it, it's, it's going to have to be based on trust. Um, you, you're going to have to be able to persuade people as they come into, let's say, a mediation center that um, what is said uh, in the mediation should remain confidential. That is an important part of people being able to put their trust in the process. 
And therefore, from the very beginning, if people come to the process with that trust, it should not be betrayed later on. Um, I don't know that there's going to be any uh, way to penalize people for, for failing to, to do so. Uh, but I think, again, one has to use persuasion and the acceptance that the system can't work effectively if you don't maintain con confidentiality. Now, there's some bit things that need to be confidential and others that don't. <laughs> but um, by and large, <laughs> the usefulness of things being confidential, I think that is something that needs to be propagated from the very beginning. So you, you're only entering into this if you are going to keep what the other side said in confidence. If you want to go and talk about what you said, um, that might be not problematic necessarily, but certainly what the other side said, what are the other side put on the table, you should not go outside and of this mediation process and talk about it. So I think it's going to have to be persuasive. Uh, it's not going to be as effective as the court, although the court itself is not um, totally foolproof when it comes to that. You know, people can still breach those rules. They may be able to penalize them, but they can be breached. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sujita. Um, Justice Bell, there is another question from uh, the audience. This is how effective have the programs been for diverting youth from violence to resolution of conflict in other ways? How much time have these programs taken to see a major inflection point in those communities? Uh, what have been ma some magic components to attract the youth? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, that's still a work in progress. The, the, the youth have to be, uh, first of all, encountered in the school system mainly. And I think the first part aspect of that is to start to train people in conflict resolution skills in, the, in their schools. So at, at a very young age, in their school systems. Now, for those who don't go to school, uh, obviously you have a problem. You don't have a captive. You don't have a, you know, a, a clear a place where you can get to them and, um, and speak to them. So you have to de depend on social workers and so on to reach that aspect of the community. Uh, one would hope that by developing conflict resolution programs in schools, mediation, train a few people to be mediators, mediators, persons who intervene to stop fights and that kind of thing in, in, in the among youth and in the school system. And um, when it comes to things like sports, et cetera, et cetera, um, <clears throat> you know, there have to be rules that are imposed to d deter certain kinds of conflict. Now, in, in, in the other aspect of it, where you talk about street, street crime and street conflict and so on and so forth, again, the approach is to treat it like if it's, a, it's an epidemic, like if it is a, a health issue and, um, and go to the community and say, look at the numbers, <clears throat> the numbers of shootings, the numbers of deaths or whatever, um, we need to reduce these numbers because there's too many funerals. There's too much, um, you know, there's too many people going into the emergency room. The, the nurses can't even cope with it anymore and so on. You got to be able to send messages like that so that people can understand that you have to find a different way to settle your problems. There is education generally. And of course, in some cases, it is basic things like jobs that people need to be able to, to be get, have a structured life. So you've got to get to work at a certain time, you've got to wake up, uh, get to work, do your work in a structured way, and then you're going to be earning something. You don't want to you know, lose your money to foolishness, so you're going to learn discipline in that regard. I think you put all those things together, you should be able to make some progress in terms of uh, getting the youth involved and getting them to see the importance and benefit of conflict resolution and uh, resolving their disputes peacefully. Thank you, sir. That question was from Ms. Sunita Kumar. Uh, Sujita, why don't you take over? Yes, thank you. Uh, Justice uh, Bell, there is a question from Kavita, our participant. 
and it goes like, what are the support provided by your government and judiciary, including lawyers for community mediation? Um, say, repeat that question for me, please. I don't what think I got the first the, What are the supports provided by your government and judiciary, including lawyers for community mediation? Oh, okay. Well, where I am at the moment, um, there's very little. So that's a, that's a work in progress. It's much more going on in the Eastern Caribbean islands of places like St. Lucia, uh, where um, they are actually trying to put um, some legislation in place, first of all, to institutionalize mediation. So I think that's a first step. Um, from there, you would, they would have to work through mediation centers to take the matters into the community. As I, I think I've said elsewhere, the, the main thing is for people to talk more and more and more about settling disputes peacefully, um, about dialogue processes, about people being able to sit down in communities and so on and so forth and talk about their problems. This is the main thing. Now, as far as the court is concerned, that connection still has to be built uh, effectively. What I was trying to relay was that I have a background of seeing some of these things in operation in the United States, trying to see how I could implement some of them in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, and what it takes is institutional support. For example, universities, um, private sector, and the public sector working together. And then of course the courts can help by, um, by, by, by making an input from the point of view of maybe special programs and procedures for certain types of, of problems, per, cer certain types of cases, and also making mediators available uh, where possible to go and contribute to the community mediation program. But this is a work in progress. I am trying to do some inspirational work here. Not all of it is something that I've seen actually in process in my actual situation here in Barbados where things are still very much at the you know, starting stages. Uh, so it is very good to be able to speak to us this kind of interest in, in, in your country. Uh, but I, I have to now build that here and see the extent to which that can happen. In St. Lucia, I was able to get the court to, to put on a, what we call a mediation campaign, which went on for a month. And that was in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the court. So we were able to go through the community and talk and go on the radio and the television and, and go on the government information service and so on and, um, and talk about mediation and how it's helpful, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the way in which the court was able to contribute to community mediation, the understanding of the importance of it and how, it, how it's gonna be done, how we can get involved. Hope that answered the question. <laughs> A difficult one. Though. Thank you, sir, thank you. When you mentioned Beatles in your speech, it's one it happens to be one of my most favorite of uh, bands of all times, especially okay. their lead singer John Lennon. His song okay. "Imagine" is an all-time favorite. Yes, yes, so mine we, too. Yes, we imagine a world. Uh, I would say that since we are running out of time and the paucity of time forces us to have this one question as the last question for the evening. It's a very relevant one, sir. Enforcing an agreement made in the community has its challenges. How to prevent them being breached or not ending up in the court process? This is a question from one of our esteemed audience. Um, I don't know if you can prevent them from ending up in the court process. The thing is this, um, a signed agreement can be treated as a contract. So first of all, and the contract will be recognized by the court. So you can get that kind of institutional um, acceptance where persons actually sign contracts. Now, it depends on the culture of the place because I am told that, for example, there was one book where I read, which I read which I, where I was told that um, Anglo-American 
uh, oil company in 1909 um, entered into an agreement with somebody with a handshake. No contract. This is an oil company. A handshake was enough. That can't happen today. But the point is, what are your cultural practices and norms? Um, are, there as, are there places in the, in the country where a handshake is still good enough? Where a promise is still good enough? Where it isn't, you're going to have to make people commit it to writing and tell them this is a contract and it can be enforced in a court. Um, so the lawyers will still have to have something to do with it, fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> the lawyers will still have to have something to do with it if it is going to be enforceable and they're going to have to advise on the best way to get it enforced. The other thing is to have systems whereby uh, in agreements, let's say operational agreements on contracts, the, the agreement itself says that you will settle all your differences by way of mediation uh, mm -hmm. so that you don't run immediately to the court. So that is in your contract. So what you, you've already locked them in to settling their differences by way of mediation. So again, the lawyers can help in that regard in terms of contracts uh, in, in, in the business arena, for example, uh, or let's say between a farmer and a, and a supermarket or suppliers that in the contract, there is a clause that says any differences will be settled by way of mediation. That's the first step. If you can't settle it by mediation, well then nobody can stop you from taking it to court. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It has been an honor. And now I will request my friend Sujita to please take over. Yeah, thank you, Pooja. It is my honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of Nivaran, mediators of the Supreme Court of India, on an engaging and informative topic, community mediation. We thank Justice Francis Bell, Judge United Nations, Dispute Tribunal for sharing such enlightening and valuable thoughts on court versus community mediation and for explaining the application of skills and the process involved in resolving matters through community mediation, wherein you see conflicts based on social, economic, and religious interest. We at Team Nivaran thank all participants for joining today's webinar and for the overwhelming response and queries in the chat box. Nivaran eagerly looks forward for your participation in the upcoming webinar lecture series. We also thank Rahul and his entire team for providing the technical assistance in organizing the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Privilege and honored. <laughs>